The next item of business is the election of a speaker. Uh, Mr. Clark, uh, I move that the honourable member for McKellar do take the chair of this house. Yeah. It's my great honour to second the nomination of the member for McKellar as a speaker of this house. The result of the ballot, the result of the ballot is Mrs. B. K. Bishop, 93 votes. Mr. Mitchell, 56 votes. Mrs. B. K. Bishop is declared elected. I will not acknowledge him again in the course of this particular area of the debate. Madam Speaker, I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. Now, Labor has just demonstrated for the last 20 minutes that they will do anything to stand in the way of lowering electricity prices in this country. Electricity bills shorten as his first political act in the parliament has desired to get his manager of opposition business to block the repeal of the carbon tax. Point of order. Point of order from the leader of uh, manager of opposition business. Ma Madam Speaker, a large number of comments were made yesterday about people being referred to by correct titles. Uh, to have the leader of the house immediately abrogating that is inappropriate and should be withdrawn. Uh, he was not actually addressing a member by any title. He was merely using a description, and I do not find the term unparliamentary. The uh, Leader of Government is Leader of the House. Hey, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I recognise the Honourable the Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, Mad Madam Speaker, I I'm not sure uh, whether you heard the description that was given, was but what we had, what we had, was something that even the Prime Minister yesterday Thank you. acknowledged could not be used order, within the chamber. And we're raising the matter a second time. I call the uh, Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, the reason why standing orders should not be suspended is because the Australian public expects this government to get on with its program. That is why they elected 90 members of the coalition on September the 7th. It was to repeal the carbon tax. The program, the draft daily program, lists the carbon tax repeal I, bills I, as the first item of business, I not parliamentary the stunts. Honourable manager of opposition business. Madam, Madam Speaker, we have no intention of trying to gag his speech, uh, uh, which but we cannot, I would we ask, cannot have a situation, I would Madam Speaker, manager, the gravity of I this new sure. ruling of allowing. I would ask the manager of opposition business to state the point of order which he is addressing, numbered as it is in the standing orders. And if it is repeating one he's already he has already raised, I have already ruled, and I won't entertain it again. Well, Madam Speaker, the gravity of that ruling to allow name-calling of any sort in this parliament no, takes us to a new low, a new low of name-calling. There is no point of order. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's very clear that the manager of opposition business doesn't know his standing orders, and in fact, the, while slightly irrelevant to the debate, the Leader of the Opposition should have stuck with the member for Grainler, who's now trying to help him, of course, in this rather embarrassing display of an aptitude on the part of the opposition. Oh, he's, got, he's now got the answer. He's now got the, the standing order number. I would say to the honourable, the manager of opposition business, that if he is intending to re-raise the same point, or I will consider frivolous or aimed simply to disrupt the proceedings of the House, I will not acknowledge him a, again in the course of this particular area of the debate. Madam Speaker, I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented from. Go right ahead. Madam Speaker, everything that was said yesterday 
I recognise the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, it is very important that a motion to dissent from the Speaker's ruling be in writing and circulated to the government. Uh, we have not yet seen the motion. Well, soon it will be served. Well, you have had to help him out, poor thing. You have had to help him out, poor lamb. Get him started. You should have had his job. Is the motion in writing? Yes, it is, and it's with and the clerks. Thank you. Proceed. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Everything that was said yesterday about what the standards of this House are going to be becomes absolutely meaningless if the ruling you gave is followed through on. What we had was a clear example of a Member of Parliament being given a name other than his title in this House. That's exactly what we had, and pointed out to you and asked to be withdrawn in the appropriate process according to the standing orders of this parliament. If we can't even get over the threshold of calling people by their title, then every word that we were told yesterday becomes meaningless. Every word we were told about what the standards of this government would be in the dealings with this House means absolutely nothing if they can't even resist the cute name calling. If they can't even get to stage one, Stage one of referring to people by their appropriate title. Madam Speaker, under the previous parliament, we had a speaker who preferred to be called by the title speaker rather than Madam Speaker, and we respected that. You made clear yesterday your preference to be called Madam Speaker, and we respect that. But to have no respect come to members of this House at all and for it to be cheap schoolyard name calling that is going to be the order of the day in this House takes us to a new low takes us to a new low. Where is the idea of the adults being in charge of the government if it's going to be a case of teasing and name-calling and cute games? That is the standard that the Leader of the House, no less, has immediately taken us to. And you, Madam Speaker, yesterday assured us and assured the Australian people this would not happen. You gave the guarantees this would not happen. And we simply want you not merely to honour promises to an election, we want you to honour promises that were made yesterday. It shouldn't be too much for members of this House to expect that stage one, no name calling, call people by their appropriate title, is something that will be honoured. Yesterday, the Prime Minister used a similar phrase to the one now used by the Leader of the House. The media picked him up on it straight away and he acknowledged one thing. He wouldn't get away with using that phrase in this chamber. Well, Madam Speaker, they shouldn't get away with using those phrases in this chamber. They shouldn't get away with being able to completely denigrate 101, principle 101, the very beginning of the principles of the standing orders, that there'll be a level of courtesy. I liked I liked some of the interviews you gave yesterday, Madam Speaker. I just can't reconcile them at all, at all, with the ruling you just gave. It's no surprise, it's no surprise at all, when we look now, that yesterday you were brought forward by the Prime Minister and the, and the Leader of the House. It's no surprise that for the first time, in defiance of Westminster tradition, we have a speaker who was physically brought here by the executive. Point of order, I recognise the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, in a motion of dissent in the Speaker's ruling, the debate needs to be very tightly uh, delivered by the opposition or by, indeed, the government. The managed opposition business is now reflecting on the Speaker by suggesting, by suggesting, no, the managed opposition business is suggesting that somehow your position is illegitimate because you were escorted to the chair and nominated and seconded by the Prime Minister and the Leader of the House. If the opposition knew what they were talking about, they would realise that the successful nominee is escorted to the chair by the person they regard as their two closest friends in the chamber, not by their positions. So therefore, it is a disgraceful slur on the election that was conducted yesterday into the speakership to now reflect on your chairmanship, not just your ruling. And I would say the marriage opposition business is sailing very close to the wind of being ejected from the parliament for that unparliamentary behaviour. I thank the Leader of the House for his point of order. 
the uh, leader of the manager of opposition business can proceed, but he might take heed of the points that were made by the leader of the house. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, I simply ask that the house take order of Standing Order 64. Which, which even has in big bold letters. It's not necessary for them to read to read the fine print. No member to be referred to by name, and for people to be referred to by their parliamentary titles. It's that simple. It's there in black and white. It's not like we need to go to the big green book to see. Oh, what's the fine detail on this? It's there as the most basic principle. But not only that, it's the one area of the standing orders that was held up yesterday. It's the one area on how we treat each other and the courtesy we show which is how this was put forward yesterday. If there was ever an example of the behaviour of this government and this House being different to what we were told it would be, it's this. In many examples we're dealing with what was said before the election. On this we are dealing with what the standing orders say in black and white. Madam Speaker, I put to the House there is no way of reading Standing Order 64 that makes it consistent with your ruling. No way at all that those words can be read and your ruling can be correct. I stood up a number of times without moving dissent in the hope that you would reconsider that ruling. We did not want to be moving dissent on the first day. We did not want to be in a situation where this parliament was different to what we were told it was going to be yesterday. But the childishness of those opposite the fact that they couldn't even keep their word for 24 hours means the one protection that this parliament is meant to have is your office, Madam Speaker. Your office is meant to be the one protection that members of parliament have to make sure that the standing orders are upheld. I put to you, Madam Speaker, and I put to the House, no one can credibly argue that that ruling and the behaviour of the Leader of the House was consistent with the standing orders of this parliament. When we vote on this dissent motion, this parliament is going to make a judgment call as to whether or not the standing orders matter, as to whether or not the words of the Prime Minister about the conduct of this House matter, and, Madam Speaker, I put it, as to whether or not the words you said yesterday matter. This is no small issue. It's not like we're dealing with a grey issue of standing orders or a fine judgment call. It's not like this is an area of huge discretion. It's really simple. Have a level of civility and abide by the standing orders. There's nothing more to it than that. And we can all bury our heads in the in House of Representatives practice. We can come up with all different arguments on a whole lot of standing orders, but there is no way around this one, Madam Speaker. Today you decide what sort of speaker you are going to be for this chamber. Today this House decides whether the words of yesterday meant a thing or whether or not they were just some cheap media lines that were put out there because they thought it was something nice to say on the first day. That's the challenge and that's the decision that is now before this House. Madam Speaker, I actually accept that you believe in this chamber. Well, if you believe in this chamber, defend its standing orders because there is no way in the world that your ruling did that. No way in the world. And we can't do more than stand up a number of times and invite you to reconsider before we are left with no choice but to move a resolution of dissent. And in doing so, in doing so, it was not until you said that you would regard it as disorderly for me to continue to raise it that we were forced into this situation of moving a dissent resolution. Madam Speaker, if this is going to be an orderly House, then the standing orders must be upheld. If this is going to be a place for schoolyard teasing and games, if this is going to be a place where name-calling is in the order of the day, then this House will back your ruling. If name-calling is going to be the order of the day and childishness is going to be the order of the day, your ruling is about to be backed up. But if the standing orders of this parliament are going to be defended, then your ruling must be dissented from, Madam Speaker. Motion seconds. I call the member for Isaac. Speaker, I second this motion of dissent in the ruling that you have made, Madam Speaker. I recognise the leader of the house. Uh, Speaker, I move that the question be now put. Oh, to to recognise the seconder. 
Well, then I move that the member be no longer heard. The question is that the member be no longer heard. Those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the, to the right of the chair and the nose to the left of the chair. 
I appoint the same tillers as previously.
The result of the division is 87 ayes and 58 noes. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I give the call. The question. I was clearly on my feet. You were on your feet. I call the member for Granger. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, yesterday, yesterday in this place, I call the leader. In this place, I call the it was said of the House it should never be a place where motives are impugned or characters are. Speaker satisfied. is trying to get. I said I called the Leader of the House on a point of order. You're not the leader. I move that the question be put. The question is that the, that the motion be put. All those in favour, please say aye. The ayes and no. I think the ayes have it. The vote is underway. The vote is underway. You can't have a point of order in the middle of a debate. In the middle of the division, I've called. I will hear the member for Greenland. Point of order is, uh, Speaker. Is it the case that the leader of the House is moving a gag on a dissent motion to the Speaker without anyone defending the Speaker's there is, ruling, there is without no a order. single defence of the Speaker's there is ruling? No there is no point of order. The member will resume his seat. The member will withdraw his seat. There is no point of order. The question is that the motion be put. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. And the question is that the member be no longer heard. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. I think the ayes have it. I, the person has been put. I'm sorry. I, I appoint the tellers again. The result of the division is ayes 87, noes 58. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The motion now is that the motion of dissent be agreed to. Those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. Is a division required? Yes. Ring the bells for one minute. Yes.
exit sound through. Lock the doors. I appoint the same tellers as previously. Would those members who have changed their vote kindly inform the tellers? Point of order from the uh, manager of opposition business. The definition with the standing orders is the area of member seats means the area of seats on the floor of the chamber reserved for members. It does not include seats in the advisers' box or special galleries, but does include the seat where the sergeant at arms usually sits. The expression is used in standing orders 128 and 129 for divisions.
Thank you. The result of the division is ayes 56, noes 87. The motion is therefore negative. I have received messages from Her Excellency the Governor General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, appropriations for the purposes of the Clean Energy Legislation Carbon Tax Repeal Bill of 2013. The Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Transitional Provisions Bill 2013, the Climate Change Authority of Abolition Bill of 2013 and the Clean Energy Finance Corporation Abolition Bill of 2013. Prior to my moving to consider the bill in detail, or the House to consider the bill in detail, I have a statement I wish to read to the House concerning the uh, amendments circulated by the opposition earlier this morning. My attention has been drawn to the detailed pay stage amendments circulated by the Honourable Member for Port Adelaide. I am concerned about the amendments on two grounds. First, it is arguable that they could in fact constitute the initiation of a proposal to impose or increase or change the scope of a charge contrary to standing order 179A. The second area of my concern is that paragraph 179B of the standing orders provides that only a minister may move an amendment to a proposal which increases or extends the scope of a proposed charge beyond the total already existing under an Act of Parliament. If I understand it correctly, there may be some doubt as to the impact of bringing forward the date of commencement of the Emissions Trading Scheme, which is the substance of the Honourable Member's amendments. On one view, the amendment should be allowed to stand, as it would be, I could be argued, the expected and likely effect of the calculation of the proposed liability could, may not exceed that set by the current law. On the other hand, because there could in fact be no certainty, it would be legally possible that the amendments would have the effect that the liability would exceed that provided under the current law. In my view, the uncertainty is too great to allow the amendments to proceed. Accordingly, I am not prepared to allow them to be moved in their present form. Accordingly, I call the uh, manager of opposition, opposition business. Madam Speaker, these amendments were circulated this morning. It is an extraordinary circumstance if we wait until the very moment that amendments are about to be moved before you raise with honourable members issues which could have been resolved by redrafting. We have a circumstance where there is a clear political debate which is significant that has been happening across the country and that should be brought to a head within this chamber, and to have a circumstance where it is brought to our attention for the first time at the moment it's about to be moved here on the floor of the chamber does a great disservice to the conduct of proper debate within this chamber. And I would ask you, Madam Speaker, given the circumstances of uh, the, the numbers within the debate, to have a circumstance where it isn't even allowed to be put, and we're not even allowed to have the argument, brings the co concepts of secrecy to an extraordinary level. And I do ask you, I do ask you, Madam Speaker, to reconsider, consi in particular, considering the timing of when this has been brought to the attention of the opposition. Here, here. Um, I call the leader of the house. Madam Speaker, on indulgence, I understand that there is no motion before the Chair with respect to your ruling, but can I just say very briefly that uh, the Senate and the House of Representatives have long had a different view about these matters, and you would be familiar with both, having served in both. In the House of Representatives, it is very clear uh, that the House cannot capably consider uh, the amendment as suggested by the member for Port Adelaide uh, with respect to revenue or appropriation matters. Only such amendments can be moved by a minister from the executive government. We had this debate several times in the last parliament uh, with the Leader of the House and the Manager of the Opposition Business on different sides of the argument. Uh, Speaker Jenkins, uh, Speakers Burke and other speakers have all ruled uh, in exactly the same way as you have ruled today. That is the precedent. Uh, it's not, unfortunately not capable for the House to consider this amendment, but as you pointed out in your ruling, as you pointed out in your ruling, you said that you wouldn't allow this amendment to go forward in its current form. 
if the member for Adelaide is capable of amending his amendment, changing his amendment and resubmitting re it, he might, you might well make a different ruling. Uh, before I call uh, the uh, member for Greenland, I would say there is precedent for such a ruling. Indeed, when one was made on Thursday, the 2nd of June 2011, and it did in fact involve myself and the bill that I had brought into this House, which in fact had had a second reading and was in line basically with the sort of situation we are in now. On that occasion, then Attorney General, Mr McClelland, made it quite clear in his submission um, to, uh, that uh, outlining the reasons why, uh, section, why Standing Order 179 should apply. Uh, his final words were these. The message comes from the Governor-General. Similarly, in the case of Justice Kirby, referred to the, the discussion in the issue in Lane's commentary on the Australian Constitution in 1997. He was referring above to Pape's case and concluded that the initiative for proposed appropriations belongs to the executive government in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution. Again, the will of the executive being referred to in the message of the Governor-General, with the Governor-General acting on the advice of the executive of the day. So with respect, Mr Speaker, your ruling is entirely consistent with the standing orders, but more than that, it is entirely consistent with our constitutional heritage, and I am upholding that ruling. I call the member for Greenland. To, to the point of order, Madam yep. Speaker, to uh, goes to your ruling, which, with respect, I don't think is correct in this instance. Um, at that uh, time, you would be very familiar with uh, the proposition to which the, attorney, the then Attorney-General responded, because it was indeed the member for McKellar mm. who was trying to do exactly what, you're trying to uh, do. what you are now saying. What you are now saying was wrong. Mm. You will recall at that time that the member for McKellar and other members of the now government benches Voted, voted that it was it was um, competent for uh, that amendment to proceed. You'd also be aware, uh, Madam Speaker, of the process of the way that amendments are drafted and put before this chamber. The amendments are done by the opposition in consultation with the clerks. It is at that point in time that it is determined upon the best proper apolitical advice on whether those amendments are in order. In this case, in spite of the fact that this legislation is being rammed through with a gag motion, with very little debate, which is why it's before, with, which is why it's before, which is why the amendments were put before the chamber today and are being voted upon just hours after without proper consideration, in spite of that fact, in spite of that fact, the uh, shadow minister has put forward these amendments in the usual way, having got <coughs> approval of the clerks, which is when, when that occurs. That occurs for very practical reasons, Madam Speaker. Uh, I, 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 I've heard your point. As you'd be aware. Well, I I've have heard further your point. points, Madam Speaker. Uh, well, I have further I, I, points. The, uh, if I the dissertation them, is a bit lengthy. And I, I have, pursue them, please. and I have a response to what you put well, forward. Well, if I could pursue all of them. If and then you can do it in a very short space of time, you may proceed. I'll do my best, Madam Speaker. And if your best isn't good enough, you may resume your seat. Well, we're, we're, and, and, and then we'll have another process, Madam Speaker, that will take 25 minutes. Indeed. So, in terms of uh, in, in, in terms of uh, in terms of the processes, also, uh, your ruling would suggest. That you are making a determination that the ETS effectively coming in the floating price earlier um, than this what is, now is envisaged. This is debate, and that is not a point no, of order. No, it goes to your rule. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm Madam sorry. Speaker. You I are am making... ruling you out of order. Madam Kindly Speaker, resume your, resume your seat, and I will address the matters you have already raised. What is the further point? Would you refer to the standing order you are relying upon? Very standing order number what? I am referring very specifically to your ruling. You have made your ruling makes a determination. And you are now debating price, my ruling. There are other the, forms of the house. On that. what the price will be. That is the making, decision that you have made on the I am basis not that the revenues would make on a my difference. Ruling. The member will resume his seat. Well, the member will resume his seat. Would you prefer to leave the chamber? No, Madam Speaker. Then resume your seat. Resume your seat. Now, very simply, 
the member has raised the question that the clerks had prepared these amendments for them. Likewise, likewise, indeed it is what he said. Indeed, a similar there will be silence. Indeed, a similar situation arose with the question of my bill, to which the member has referred. It too was prepared by the clerks, and it had had a second reading. And this point was raised at the point of where we were to proceed further. So, when uh, um, this issue is now being dealt with, I did speak to the, uh, the member for Port Adelaide as, as soon as I could possibly do so, because I did not take this question lightly. I did do quite a deal of research into the question because of my concern about it. I haven't finished yet. Thank you very much. The point, the point is that these are in line with the, with the previous uh, ruling of the Speaker. Uh, the member for Graindler said that we voted against it, which we did, but I accept the ruling of the Speaker as being appropriate. Accordingly, manager of government business, of oh. opposition business, I'm sorry. As you'd appreciate, we don't have a written copy of, of the ruling. Uh, point of order one, under Standing Order 179C. I'm trying to work out how the amendment that reduces the current pricing arrangements can be seen as an amendment which would increase the scope of the charge proposed beyond, no, beyond, not beyond the bill before us, but beyond any act of parliament. Now, it's the act of parliament that's the reference point, and I'm trying to work out how other than by making what might be a political point across the chamber, you've reached a conclusion about price. Yes. I'm relying on section 179A and B, only a minister may initiate a proposal. A proposal is a proposal and your amendment is a proposal. And it is a proposal to increase, and it's covered by the words impose, increase or decrease a tax or duty or charge, change the scope of any charge. I call the Honourable the uh, Minister for the Environment. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. If it assists the House on indulgence, I would refer to page 420 of House of Representatives practice. I think that that provides an important guide as to the interpretation here, uh, not just of the standing orders but also of the Constitution. Page 420 says, and I quote, it is a long established and strictly observed rule which expresses a principle of the highest constitutional importance that no public charge can be incurred except, except on the initiative of the executive government. On every reading, on every reading, what this set of amendments attempts to do is to bring forward a variation on a public charge and to change its the scope. Minister, the minister no will doubt receive, or debate. The minister will resume his seat for a moment. I call the manager of opposition business. Madam Speaker, would you kindly table your ruling so that we can have a look at exactly what you've got there? Well, um, I may if I wish, but I've made the ruling and I've stated it. Well, no, no. And, uh, <laughs> I've made the ruling. I see no reason why. Uh, yes, we can have a. Yes, well, I can have a copy made subsequently and made available to you. The problem is, as you would appreciate, the debate that we have to consider whether or not we now have needs to happen within the moment. Uh, it's now well, some I... time since yeah. you first said it. We still don't have a copy of it, notwithstanding that the amendments were circulated this morning. Uh, I don't want to be in a situation where we have no choice but to move a further resolution. Well, I would put it to the member that that is a proper proceeding of the House if the, if the member wishes to do so. But I think this is a very important constitutional point, uh, which was made very ably by Attorney General McClelland in the previous government. And I believe. I believe I believe this, the ruling that I have made as a considered ruling 
and one of importance and upholding a previous ruling should stand. Uh, the member, it is quite uh, open to the uh, manager of government business to take another action if he wishes to do so, and I invite him to do so forthwith if he wishes to. Yeah. Madam Speaker, I move that your ruling be dissented from. Yeah. 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 Madam Speaker, it is extraordinary for us now to be having a conversation about whether or not the parliament is allowed to debate what has been debated throughout Australia for so long. It is extraordinary, after all the conversation that has happened up until now about the shift to emissions trading and making sure that there actually is a limit on pollution rather than pollution being unlimited, that we are now being told in this new parliament that's a conversation you're not allowed to have. That in this parliament, those amendments, not simply the debate gets gagged, which we thought was bad enough. Your ruling, Madam Speaker, isn't that the debate gets gagged, it's that the debate is not allowed to occur at all. Yeah. At all. And if there is a duty of the Speaker in this House, it has to begin with the concept of facilitating debate. And if, it is, and if there is a view, if there is a view, Madam Speaker, that you think amendments that have been circulated are in fact contrary to standing orders, and you know full well that the debate has already had a gag put on it by the government, you know full well, Madam Speaker, that there might not be time for redrafting to occur unless you provide the opposition with notice. Yeah, yeah. What would possess you, Madam Speaker, in those circumstances? to wait until the commencement of the debate before we were told. Because in doing so, Madam Speaker, you guarantee that the debate cannot occur on the floor of this chamber. You actually guarantee the opposite of what is generally understood to be the role of the Speaker. You guarantee not that a, that a vigorous debate will occur, but you guarantee that a vigorous debate will be ruled out. I've been critical of the Leader of the House for the gag resolutions that he's brought down in this chamber. I've been critical of the Leader of the House for the idea that debate on amendments would be limited to an hour. It never occurred to anyone on this side of the chamber that there would be an attempt from the Speaker that to view one hour of debate as too long and to say the figure of one hour needed to be reduced to zero for the purpose of discussing these amendments. Madam Speaker, it should be within the remit of this parliament to be able to debate the issues which have been discussed and flagged well in advance. And with the knowledge of the one hour deadline already applying to the conduct of this debate, the, the precedent which you quote, Madam Speaker, I have to say is a real stretch. Because in that debate, even though, as you say, Madam Speaker, it wasn't brought to your attention until the beginning of the proceedings, I hazard a guess that there wasn't a one-hour limit on consideration in detail that day. I hazard a guess that we don't have those circumstances. But, Madam Speaker, most importantly, to think that you would refer to Standing Order 179 A and B as though Part C just isn't on the page. It's just not there. And the reason, Madam Speaker, that you won't refer to Standing Order 179C is because it would allow the amendment. That's exactly why we actually have a circumstance, Madam Speaker, where you are consciously and knowingly ignoring one of the standing orders. If A and B were the only standing orders which were there, the decision you have made, the ruling that you have made, would at least be arguable, notwithstanding the fact that the process you have followed restricts debate in an unacceptable way in this chamber. But to ignore the words of 179C, a member who is not a minister may move an amendment to the proposal which does not increase or extend the scope of the charge proposed beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. The amendments which are to be before the House and which have been circulated by the member for Port Adelaide fall entirely within that standing order, entirely within. And, Madam Speaker, you have put the House in a situation where, where we don't get a written copy of your ruling, but which I think would be more helpful, Madam Speaker, 
would be if you were provided with a written copy of the standing orders. That's right. Because a written copy of the standing orders, I believe, would have led you to a circumstance where no reasonable person could have made the ruling that you just made. It cannot be justified under the standing orders, and it certainly can't be justified if you have the slightest part of belief in having debate in this chamber. I must say, Madam Speaker, it is the first time I can recall when I have had a speaker refer to the government's position using the pronoun we. That was an extraordinary part of the way you sought to explain yourself to the chamber. If there was ever, if it wasn't enough for us to have a speaker physically brought to the chair by a prime minister and a leader of the house, to then have rulings that are governed by the term we, referring to yourself and the government as one, changes the role of your chair entirely, changes the role of the high office you occupy entirely. Madam Speaker, we were told that you would be an independent speaker. This ruling is entirely inconsistent with that. The timing you have given on this ruling is entirely inconsistent with that. The lack of notice you have given to the opposition is entirely, entirely inconsistent with that. We were told that things would be transparent. Well, I've got to say you've delivered on that one, because this is entirely transparent. Because what these amendments would have done, what these amendments would have done, Madam Speaker, is force those opposite to actually vote squarely on the question of the tax alone and change it to a circumstance where you could get rid of the tax but pollution could not be unlimited. That was exactly what these amendments did, exactly what they did. And now government members, because of you shielding them from that question, get to avoid that. That is a reflection on the chair and I ask you to withdraw. It's a dissent motion, Madam Speaker. I have moved the resolution because I think your ruling is wrong. I'm a, I do not resile from that for one moment. I'm not referring to that. I call the Leader of the House. Point of order, Madam Speaker. I think the point that the Speaker is making is not that you uh, shouldn't be able to dissent from her ruling, but during that, I'll be quiet, you buffoon. Disorderly conduct. Check it out. Look it up. The point is that in your dissent motion, the member's dissent motion, he's perfectly entitled to disagree with the Speaker's ruling, but he's not allowed to reflect personally on the Speaker and her impartiality. And that is what the Speaker is asking you to withdraw. And I would ask you to do so on behalf of the Speaker. I call the, the reflection on uh, the chair that I was withdraw. made. Thank you. Madam I call Speaker. again the member. Madam Speaker, Manager of opposition business. on saying that they'd be transparent, they have delivered in spades. Because we have, we have an, a situation now where all of this means one very simple thing. The government get to avoid a vote. The government get to avoid a, a vote, and this parliament avoids a debate. And what does it say about how they feel about the strength of their arguments when this is where we end up? Madam Speaker, had there been early notice, I have no doubt this would have been able to be rectified. No, to your satisfaction, I have no no doubt, no doubt there would have been a way. And and notwithstanding notwithstanding the interjections opposite, and notwithstanding the the shaking of your head, Madam Speaker, when I said that this could be rectified, uh, you did refer to the opportunity for things to be redrafted. And I take those words of yours in good faith. And in turn, I I acknowledge that the timing of this. Makes it impossible. Makes it impossible. The timing of it, Madam Speaker, the manner of delivery, the ruling itself, the ignoring of standing order C within the very section you chose to refer to, has put this Parliament in a situation where debate is being silenced and amendments, which I have to say, it's not like the amendments were about to form a majority of the chamber. It's not like that was about to happen. It's not like they needed to be running high and scared from the outcome. It should be reasonable mm -hmm. that there's never a culture of secrecy here on the floor of the chamber. Yeah. Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker uh, your rulings when you ask for things to be withdrawn 
when you make different rulings, when you've asked us to quieten down at different points, when you get on your feet, we will respect your role. But, Madam Speaker, you need to abide by the standing orders. And, and on am. this occasion, and you I have would not. ask that again as a reflection on the chair, and I'd ask you to withdraw. Oh, yes. may, um, may I speak to the point of order? You can disagree with my ruling, but you cannot say that I'm not abiding by the standing orders. M Madam Speaker, then how can I move dissent? The, the, basis, the basis of a dissent. I'm not presuming any ill will on your part, Madam you. Speaker. I'm not presuming any ill will, but I don't know how I can move dissent without saying that you were wrong on the standing orders. I, I don't know how else a dissent are, motion can correct, take effect. You are correct to disagree with my ruling on the standing orders. That is not to say uh, at large that I don't comply with the standing orders. That is a reflection on the chair. So, and at the end there? Uh, Madam Speaker, your ruling must be dissented from. I presume your time on this is out. It has elapsed. I call the honourable member for Port Adelaide. Well, <coughs> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and Madam Speaker, uh, since your ruling, I've had the opportunity. I call the leader of government business. Is the member for Port Adelaide seconding the motion? Otherwise, well, he needs to say so. Is the member seconding the motion? I second the motion. Is no, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. Is, uh, is thank the you, member Madam, for Adelaide? Thank you, Madam Speaker. And, since your ruling, I've been able to read your written statement, uh, and as uh, the manager of opposition business pointed out, the statement appears to rely particularly on uh, Standing Order 179A and 179B, as I uh, but said. doesn't refer expressly to the provisions in 179C, which provides that a member who is not a minister, in this case myself, may move an amendment to the proposal which does not increase or extend the scope of the charge beyond the total already existing under any Act of Parliament. So what is the, que what is the question uh, here at issue? The question here at issue uh, is what, what is the effect of the amendment moved by me uh, on the existing Act that is proposed to be amended or repealed by the government? Well, the effect of the amendment proposed by me is to change the way in which carbon pricing works in the financial year 2014 to 2015. To change the way. So what is, what is the way in which it, it is changed? Well, the way in which it is changed is it moves from the fixed price that is currently set out in the legislation, described by the opposition over a long period of time as the carbon tax, to a floating price. So it moves to an emissions trading scheme. Uh, it doesn't bring in any, any additional liable entities. Uh, so the only way there is no change to scope. The only way 179C, the only the only way in which 179C uh, can be uh, activated, is an argument that it increases the charge. The charge currently set, I think, at $24.15 per tonne. Now that is a judgment to be made, and it is a judgment that you have made, Speaker, from which uh, we greatly dissent. Uh, this is not a new set of amendments. These are the set of amendments that we released when in government as an exposure draft uh, before the September 7 election. Uh, we released it. Uh, it was subject to public consultation and it was released with very clear statements from the Prime Minister, uh, then Kevin Rudd, from the then yeah. Treasurer Bowen and from myself about Treasury's advice on the impact in 2014-15 of moving from a fixed price, the carbon tax, as the now government like to call it, to a floating price under an emissions trading scheme. And Treasury's advice was very clear. Treasury's advice was that the price would move from around $24 to around 6 that it would be reduced by 75 per cent. Uh, and it seems to me, although uh, the now government refuses to release any information about the basis of their current policy, won't release the incoming brief, which Alan Kohler tells us this morning uh, apparently indicates that direct action, their policy, will cost $10 billion per year. Well, release your incoming brief and we'll know whether or not it's false. Uh, the only thing we have to go on is, is articles from Alan Kohler. So they won't release the incoming brief. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the member for Port Adelaide needs to be arguing why your ruling should be dissented from. He shouldn't be arguing about the substance of the amendment or the bill. He's had that opportunity and, in consideration in detail, he'd have the opportunity again. 
the uh, Leader of the House makes a very valid point, and I would ask the member to Thank you, Madam to Speaker. the substance the, the, of okay, the motion. The point I was trying to make, Madam Speaker, with the greatest of respect, was that what your ruling has done is sought to make an assessment about the financial impact mm -hmm. of the change in 2014-15. Mm -hmm. uh, no, not the scope, the financial impact, because there is no change to scope, there is no change to the liable entities, there is, there is no change. What, what is changed is the way in which the price per tonne is fixed. And Treasury's Since advice debating, was that that price would reduce by three quarters. Now, you're now not debating the question as to why my ruling should be dissented. Well, I am directly from. debating it because, you, no, you're because not. Madam you're Speaker, with arguments. the greatest of respect, your ruling makes an assessment that a change from a fixed price to a floating price in 2014-15 will increase that price. If that, you read well, that is the only way in which, in which Standing Order 179C cannot apply and cannot cover my I amendments. call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, with, with the greatest of respect, the dissent motion is about your ruling mm -hmm. that the House is not capable of considering this amendment. You have made no assessment at all about the financial implications of any of these matters. And to, uh, to, accuse, you of doing so, to accuse you of doing so is quite out of order. You need to study exactly what you are dissenting from, uh, and then you will be in a position to argue it more successfully. I simply ask the, mem the member to continue to it's based address on an assessment the motion. that the impact of our amendments would increase the charge. The only advice in the public realm is that it would reduce it by 75 per cent. The time has expired. I call the Leader of the House. Oh, and the question is that the, uh, uh, the motion moved by the manager of opposition business that there be a dissent from the, uh, from the Speaker's ruling be agreed to. I call the Leader of the House. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I don't wish to detain the House uh, at great length because the debate management motion that I had passed uh, earlier in the debate uh, provides for the consideration of detail to begin uh, once the second reading has been carried and you have stated that the House will now consider the bill in detail. So the opposition is in fact uh, denying themselves the opportunity to consider the bills in detail by moving this dissent motion in your ruling. Very simply, Madam Speaker, uh, the ruling that you have made is entirely consistent with every other ruling of a similar nature to do with the capabilities of the House to amend or change legislation introduced by the executive. It is very clear in section 179A of the standing orders, only a minister may initiate a proposal to impose, increase or decrease a tax or duty or change the scope of any charge. It is very straightforward, Madam Speaker. It is there because the House of Representatives, uh, the government needs to initiate money bills in the House of Representatives. And any amendment to try and change money bills uh, is outside the capability of anybody other than someone from the executive. Now, the opposition knows this, Madam Speaker, because we had these debates quite routinely when we were in opposition uh, before September the 7th. The opposition knows this, uh, and this dissent motion, as along with their amendment, uh, is a try-on. It would be quite unprecedented for you to have ruled in any other way than that the House is incapable of uh, dealing with this particular amendment. And you did very generously, I thought, give the opposition the opportunity to try and move another amendment in consideration in detail, which didn't offend the standing orders or the Constitution of Australia, which makes it clear that only the executive can initiate money bills. Now, for the benefit of the House and for many of the new members, why is that so? It is so because the history of the Westminster tradition is one of civil war in the 17th century which caused such great ructions in Britain that the parliament that replaced the civil war only allowed the executive to initiate money bills to make it clear between the Crown and the parliament who was responsible for what. Now, we have inherited that Westminster system, and therefore it would be quite improper for you to have ruled in any other way than that the opposition cannot initiate changes to a money bill. Now, the member for Port Adelaide made it very clear that that is exactly what his amendment seeks to do. And I quote him. He said the that the, his amendment changes the way the charge is collected and changes the timing of the act. In other words, it extends the scope 
of the bill. That is your quotation. That is your quotation from your speech. In other words, Madam Speaker, the opposition and the matter of opposition business in the House did it as well throughout his contribution, kept repeating the fact that this amendment, this amendment extended the scope uh, and, and that he believes that we're capable of doing that in the House of Representatives today on a motion initiated by the opposition. Now, when we were in opposition, it was very clear that only the executive could initiate such changes, and it is very important that the House upholds uh, the standards that have been set over the course of our parliament. I could go on at great length, Madam Speaker, but I want to get on with the consideration of de in detail, and as a consequence, I move that the question be put. The question before the House is that the question be put. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Is the division required? Is the division required? Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair and the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint the same tellers as before.
The result of the division is ayes 82, noes 51. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now before the chair is the motion moved by the member for Watson of dissent in the speaker's ruling. All those, the question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Is a division required? Ring the bells for one minute. Anybody who has come into the chamber after the previous division would please advise the tellers of their coming into the chamber. I'm sorry, there are still three seconds left. If there is somebody outside the door, they may be admitted. I repeat what I said earlier. If somebody has come into the chamber who wasn't in the chamber previously, would they come forward and advise the teller? The tellers. Tellers remain the same tellers as previously.
The result of the division is eyes 49, nose 85. The question is therefore negative. The House will now consider the bills in detail in accordance with the resolution agreed on on the 18th of November. The bills will be taken together. The question is that the bills be agreed to. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, on a point of order understanding orders 91 and 92, uh, on social media the members from Morton and McEwen have been reflecting uh, on the chair. Uh, the impartiality of the chair. I'd point out to you that the member for McEwen is the second deputy speaker. Uh, I point out that what I regard as disorderly conduct. Uh, so the member for Jager Jager thinks that just reflecting on the member for McEwen is the same as reflecting on the speaker, does she? The member for, the member for McEwen has a higher level of responsibility. On social media, on Twitter, during the division and during the debate. The members of McEwen and Mitchell are reflecting quite improperly on the chair and your impartiality. Uh, as the Speaker, I'd ask you to consider whether this is disorderly conduct and what action you might like to take. I don't wish to take it to another level of privilege, for example. It might well be because of the inexperience of the members and their lack of knowledge of the opposition. I would certainly ask the manager of opposition business in the House to counsel members about reflecting on the impartiality of the chair, but I ask you to consider it rather than acting immediately, unless you choose to act immediately, and uh, whether it has been a reflection on the chair and therefore is disorderly conduct and how you might like to deal with it. I thank the uh, Leader of the House for his uh, um, point of order. I would say that we have decided in this chamber that we do allow electronic media to be used uh, and that it is in the uh, responsibility of individual members to abide by the standing orders in the way in which they use uh, that electronic media and social media. I would be disappointed if the second deputy <coughs> speaker had so reflected. Uh, I would find that um, if others have so reflected, then they might like to cons consider their actions themselves. But I would simply remind you that the use of electronic media, the same rules pertain as to speaking in the House. Uh, Leader of the House, I call Madam Speaker, uh, I would point you to precedents in the, these matters before. The member for Canning. Uh, was involved in a precedent in previous parliaments involving Speaker Andrew was asked to apologise to the Speaker in the House uh, under threat of uh, more serious action being taken. You might like to take on reflecting on the Speaker, which is not allowed to be done in the chamber on, and on Twitter. You're not allowed to do it. You're not allowed to do it. I simply point out that precedent to you, Madam Speaker. I thank the uh, Leader of the House and call the Manager of Opposition Business. Uh, on uh, the same point of order, I take it? Madam, Madam Speaker, just uh, to, the, to the point of order on indulgence, or however I may no, say No, we don't do points of order on indulgence. You're either speaking to the point of order or not. Uh, point of order, uh, Madam on Speaker. On that point of order was raised. Yeah, for the point of order that was raised. Uh, the, the issue of digital media within the chamber is one that I know has been raised with you in the interviews that you did shortly after becoming Speaker. Uh, and if, if you do uh, wish to provide clarity at some point on how it's to be used within the chamber, then, then the opposition would, would welcome that clarity. I, well, I've actually just done that. I've said yeah, that it, it appeared to be different to what I recalled from the Sky News interviews. So, uh, it is if, still used in, in, in the chamber. Okay. Thank you, Madam. There is no intention of not having it used in the chamber, but you do have to abide by the standing orders uh, in its use. So I think. Uh, no, there's no indulgence. I'm sorry, no, certainly not indulgence. What point of order? On your the I've just, point I've just raised by on. the leader of the opposition. No, this is not uh, a leader. debate on the issue. We've just ruled on the point of order. The manager of opposition business asked me how it was to be used, and I've answered the question. Well, well that'll be new. The member for Morton uh, has 
Speaking to what? Uh, to the uh, reflection on the chair. And I, I do wish to apologise for the retweet that I put. And uh, I did make a line ball call, and I, I would certainly refrain from so doing in the future. And I would make every endeavour to assist the House wherever possible, Madam Speaker. Is that an apology as well? If you so require, Madam Speaker. I thank you take for it as apology. you may. Thank you. Thank you. I thank the honourable member for Morton. Uh, we are now going to the consideration in detail. The question is that the bills be agreed to, and I call the honourable member. Negative. Clark. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Infrastructure Australia Act 2008 and for other purposes. I have received a message from Her Excellency the Governor-General recommending, in accordance with section 56 of the Constitution, an appropriation for the purposes of this bill. Is leave granted for the third reading to be moved immediately? Madam Speaker, leave is not granted, and I move that so much of standing orders is be suspended as is necessary to allow the member for Watson to move the following resolution. That this House condemns the government for a failure to allow proper debate on legislation before the Parliament. Madam Speaker, we're in the middle of a debate on important legislation about the infrastructure leader, leader of the and House. the cowardice of the Leader of the House. The motion is that the member be no longer heard. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the, sorry. Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I point the same tenors as, tellers as previously. The result of the division is eyes 84, nose 51. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? Indeed, I, Madam Speaker. Uh, the I second the, the motion and I have nothing more to say. <laughs> I call the uh, Leader of the House. With respect, Madam Speaker, you need to now. Point of order. Point of order for, Point the, of member, order. for the member for Greenland. You need to now that I have concluded my speech. You need to put the resolution to the House because I have concluded it before you give someone else a call. Yeah, well, you need, you need to do that, Speaker. The ma manager of opposition business knows that. Well. Um. The former leader of the House, who is now apparently the acting manager of government, uh, opposition business, uh, has um, 
has given the chair advice. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Um, both, both, the, both the manager of opposition business and the leader of the House will resume their seats. Both will resume their seats. If the manager of opposition business is raising on a point of order to resume his status, then it is acknowledged. Madam Speaker, the manager of opposition order. business. Madam Speaker, if you want to be an impartial chair, I ask that you withdraw. I ask that you withdraw. I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, the government opposes the. Um I recognise the manager of opposition business and have already said that I, that I acknowledge the manager of opposition business. Madam now Speaker, point of order, Madam Speaker. Point of order, Madam Speaker. The member will resume his seat. The manager of opposition business will resume his seat. There will be no further points of order acknowledged. Point of order, Madam Speaker. Order, the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented. Oh, good. Oh, good. Just rule that no other points of order will be purged. If that is a ruling, that is a ruling, and I move that the Speaker's ruling be dissented. The question is that the motion be agreed to. No, Madam Speaker, there has never been an occasion. There has never been an occasion when a speaker has refused to allow a resolution for dissent to be heard. And your role and everything that is contained in practice falls apart if you will not even hear a dissent motion. I have perfect the member will resume his seat. No, Madam Speaker, I don't need to Both members will resume their seats. You are asked to resume your seat. You'll do so. You will resume your seat. Now, you have said that you are dissenting from my ruling. Uh, whether or not you consider I have made a ruling, I do not consider I made a ruling. However, however. I will entertain your dissent motion if you wish to pursue it. Madam Speaker, critical to the role of Speaker in this House is the one principle that the Speaker will not engage in debate. Now, the comments that you made, the comments that you made with respect to me, would be interjections that were reasonable when you were merely in this House as a member for McKellar. Rules that were reasonable for any minister to get up and try to make a half funny childish interjection. But you need to recognise, Madam Speaker, that you are meant to be impartial. You need to recognise, Madam Speaker, that the office you hold is greater and more important than your own political rhetoric. You need to recognise, Madam Speaker, that we have not previously. Time this fast was brought to an end, and I move the speaker. Oh, no this is the adults, is it? In a dissent. The motion is that the member be no longer heard. The motion is that the speaker be no longer heard. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock the doors. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chairs. Chair, I point the same tellers as previously.
this is where Thank you very much. The result of the division is ayes 84, noes 49. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Is the motion seconded? I call the member for Graindler. Yes, Madam Speaker. A high degree of impartiality in the execution of the, the duties of, the of House. office is one of the hallmarks of good no speakership. The is that the That's what the House no of Representatives practice. All in favour say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Member for Grandler. Yes, I'm just wondering, Madam Speaker, whether there is any precedent for a shutting down of a dissent debate in the Speaker of the House of Representatives since 1901. Ever. Ever. I'm not aware that's a point of order. Because there hasn't been in the last 17 years. It's not a point of Madam order. Speaker. There's no point of order.
lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint the same tellers as before. The question is that the member be no longer heard. You're right, Jim. We've got a.
The result of the division is ayes 84, noes 49. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. The question now is, the time having expired, the question is that the suspension motion be agreed. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary? Aye. I think the noes have it. Aye. Division required? Yes. Ring the bells for one minute. Their numbers are depleted. They're just leaving and dropping. Yes. So dropping. No, no, they've moved. You have to. Sorry. Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint the same tellers as before. The motion, and I repeat to the House, is that the dissent motion be agreed.
The result of the division is ayes 49, noes 84. The question is therefore negative. The question now is that the suspension mission be agreed. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. To the contrary? No. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Members will remain in their seats. Any, any member who wishes to change their vote will advise the tellers. Uh, anyone who enters the chamber as a new voter will also advise the tellers. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint the same tellers. And I repeat, everyone to remain in their seats. And any new, anyone who changes their vote, advise the teller.
The result of the division is ayes 49 and noes 84. The question is therefore negatived. And I call the Leader of the House. He's not even, He's not even seeking the <laughs> Anticipation. I have I call to get the Leader of the House. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I move that so much of the standing orders be suspended as to prevent the motion for the third reading being moved without delay. The question is that uh, the standing orders be suspended as would not as would prevent the motion for the third reading being moved without delay. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, speaking to the motion, the fact is that I in give terms a call of to the member for Granger. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The fact is that the opposition have amendments to this legislation House. that's before the no longer heard. Oh. The motion is that the member be no longer Another. heard. All those in favour, please say aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No, 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 no. Division required. Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes. I call the honourable member for Hunter. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer him to Friday's revelation that the Minister for Agriculture previously sought to influence the conduct of litigation involving his benefactor, Gina Reinhardt. Has the Prime Minister counselled the Minister that uh, any personal intervention in similar court cases in the future the would be inappropriate? The member totally out of order. And Prime Minister, the, the question is out of order, and he knows it's out of order. On what basis, Madam Speaker? Madam Speaker, point of order. Point of order. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Madam Speaker, for a long time in this House, it has been appropriate to ask the Prime Minister about the ministerial code of conduct. You interrupted. You interrupted the mem member for Hunter at the exact point he was asking about the ministerial code of conduct. I hear from the leader of the op uh, leader of government business. Uh, far be it from me to help the man of position business in question time, but the question was about a period of time in which the member for New England wasn't actually a minister of this house, and therefore it's not a matter within the purview of the prime minister's responsibility. Madam Speaker, if you can assist the house, I'll be happy to rephrase the question. No, the question is you are asking a question about a matter for which the prime minister has no responsibility. Uh, under section 98 and under standing order 98, it is out of order. I call the honourable member for Casey. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for the Infrastructure. Member for Casey has the call. Thank you, Madam the member Speaker. Member for Casey has the call. The member My question is to the seat. Assistant Minister for resume Infrastructure and Regional Development. And I ask the Minister to update to the leave? House on action the government is taking to on deliver. What? Vital infrastructure Not of its in Victoria, to and to outline how this will create jobs and boost the economy. The member for Casey, I would refer the manager of opposition business to page one to page one eighty nine of the practice when he is obviously on his feet for those purposes. Madam now he'll resume his seat. He'll resume his seat, and you know perfectly well if it's designed to disrupt, you may not. I won't argue with you. You resume your seat, and at the end of question time, we'll listen. On what? I said yes. I've asked you on what. You have the call for one moment. Okay. The point of order is on the fact that you ruled a question out of order without it being completed. You should hear the completion of the question. No Otherwise, of how can you say it sounds? The member for Casey will have has the call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Assistant Minister for Infrastructure and Regional Development. You resume your seat. Resume your seat. Resume your seat or leave. The member for Casey. The member for Casey will resume his seat. The member for Isaacs will desist. Uh, the member for Hunter, I said your question was out of order. You offered to rephrase it. I said it is out of order. Madam Speaker. I said the question was out of order. Madam Speaker, I take a point of order. You can have one moment. You yourself, Madam Speaker, have set the precedent. On a number of occasions, numerous occasions in this place, you have, have allowed members to rephrase 
their questions yes, I because have. you thought they brought it on not being compliant I, with the I standing have allowed orders. It, I have allowed it for a variety of reasons, but being out of order in this way against section, standing order 98 is not one of them. I think it would be helpful if you let me finish the question. Casey has the call. Well, I'll be back tomorrow, Madam Speaker. Good. I look forward to it. No. Oh, good. No, no, you can't. You can't. You're out of order. You're out of order. I would ask the clerk, was it formally moved? Was it formally moved? Did he move it? Did he? Right. Uh, the clerk is of the opinion that it had been moved. So you may go ahead. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I move that the chair's ruling be dissented from. Madam Speaker, what we've just seen in the ruling you have given is ruling a question out of order without allowing the question to be stated. It's as simple as that. What was given at the beginning of the question set the context for it, and at the end of the question, the, the Shadow Minister for Agriculture had just started, had just started, Madam Speaker, to ask about future action taken by the Prime Minister with respect to the Ministerial Code of Conduct. Something which must be allowed. Because make no mistake about the gravity of this. We have a ruling of a court reflecting on the behaviour of someone who is now a Minister of the Crown. This is a significant issue which we have a right to discuss within the parliament. And you cannot, Madam Speaker, simply because the preface to the question dealt with what happened to him prior to being a minister, rule that the latter part of the question is out of order when it deals exactly with what the Prime Minister is going to do now in counselling or not counselling giving a tick of approval or showing the disapproval that the Australian people feel and that a court now feels for the behaviour of the Minister for Agriculture. Madam Speaker, the contempt of the parliament is shown by the fact that the minister concerned himself can't even remain within the chamber while this is debated. The contempt for the parliament is shown, Madam Speaker, by the fact that you as Speaker would not even allow a question to be completed, knowing full well that had the question been completed, it was entirely within standing orders. Knowing full well, Madam Speaker, that you were not shutting down a question that was out of order, you were shutting down a debate within this parliament. You were shutting down, Madam Speaker, a discussion about whether or not, whether or not the behaviour in future of the Minister of the Crown can be consistent with what a judge has now reflected on. Whether the behaviour of the Minister of the Crown in future should be allowed to occur in a way that has been deeply reflected on by a court and goes directly to the benefit of someone who is a personal benefactor to that minister. This is a serious question to be asked within the parliament. And, Madam Speaker, the gravity of it I think you knew well when you decided to not allow the question to be completed. Because the only moment at which you could have said it was out of order would have been if the member for Hunter had completed at that moment. But he was continuing, and you knew, Madam Speaker, he was continuing, and so you stopped him there. You did not allow a rephrase, you did not allow a completion of the question in the full knowledge, Madam Speaker, that had there been a completion of the question, it was clearly within the standing orders. A lot of the Australian people, Madam Speaker, would like to know whether the Prime Minister thinks what the Minister for Agriculture did was OK. A lot of the Australian people, Madam Speaker, want to know whether this Prime Minister gives a tick to the future for his ministers to want to interfere in private litigation. Madam Speaker, the email that was concerned the email that was concerned was no small matter. This was somebody who was senior, not merely on the front bench of his party at the time, but then, as in now, seen as a potential future deputy prime minister when that side of the house is in office. And, Madam Speaker, in that context, in that context, 
it has to be allowed that this parliament is a place where he can be answerable. We know full well from the behaviour of the Prime Minister and by quickly they, how they scurried out the door that it will appear the Ministerial Code of Conduct will do nothing to improve his behaviour in the future. It appears full well, Madam Speaker, that his own sense of what's right and wrong, given that he wrote the email when he did, shows that he thinks this sort of behaviour is OK. The one place where he needs to be answerable, Madam Speaker, is on the floor of this parliament. And your ruling, your ruling, Madam Speaker, said that this parliament will allow the issue to be suppressed. Your ruling, Madam Speaker, said that this parliament will make no attempt to pull into line this Minister for Agriculture, that the Prime Minister can't even be asked whether or not that behaviour will be acceptable into the future. Madam Speaker, the way in which the benefactor concerned has provided assistance to the Minister for Agriculture is not limited to him. Gina Reinhart flew three coalition MPs to Hyderabad in a private jet. It was not only, it was not only Madam Speaker, the Minister for Agriculture who was concerned here. It was also the Foreign Minister, Madam Speaker, the Foreign Minister not present here today, as well as the Minister for Agriculture, who has been a direct beneficiary of this individual, a direct beneficiary who a member of the front bench, seen as a future Deputy Prime Minister when there's a coalition government, is willing to try to interfere in private litigation. Madam Speaker, be in no doubt, every time your rulings try to shut down debate in this parliament, the Australian people know to look more carefully. Every time there's an attempt by this government to cover up, the warning lights go off throughout the entire community. Madam Speaker, there is no way in the world, at its simplest understanding orders, that this ruling can be justified. Because at its core, Madam Speaker, you ruled that a question was out of order when it had not been completed. You ruled, Madam Speaker, that a question which you could not possibly know the contents of because it hadn't been said out loud, but you knew it was out of order. Madam Speaker, that sort of ruling makes a joke of the parliament. That sort of ruling, Madam Speaker, makes a farce of this being question time. Be in no doubt. We've sort of given up on the concept that their answers will be relevant. We've sort of given up on the concept, after the ruling was made a while ago, that if we use fairness in the question, anything that relates to the word fair is somehow in. We know that that ruling's been made. But now to be at the point where you won't even allow a question to be stated. You won't even give them a chance to evade and to perform and to cavort and to play the little games that this mob over here play in question time because you can't even bear to hear the full 30 seconds of an opposition statement. You can't even bear to allow a question to go for the full 30 seconds allowed. You can't even bear, Madam Speaker, for the question to set the context and then ask for the detail of what the Prime Minister will do now. Madam Speaker, it is essential if question time is going to remain some sort of question and answer session back forth, that there will at least be questions that are not Dorothy Dix's. But over the last few weeks, Madam Speaker, more and more you are ruling questions from the opposition out of order. And today your ruling took it to an absolutely new level where the ruling was made before the question had been stated. Yeah, yeah. Madam Speaker, there is no way on earth you knew whether or not a question was out of order that you hadn't heard. There is no way on earth you knew. And the opposition handled it the correct way. We rose on points of order and asked, could the question be concluded so that you could then rule? The, the member for Hunter asked whether it could even be rephrased, notwithstanding that you'd ruled on something he hadn't even completed. The opposition has made every effort in question time today to not get to the point that we're at right now. But we're at the point we're at right now, Madam Speaker, because of the arrogance of this government and because of the way you have used your position in that chair to prevent questions from being asked. To prevent questions from being asked, Madam Speaker. This is an issue, this is an issue that goes to the heart of the character of people who sit opposite that goes to the heart 
of the character of the Minister for, of the Minister for Agriculture and whether or not the Prime Minister not I agree whether he sanctions what was done in the past prior to him being a minister, if that's what was being asked, it would have been out of order. But you ruled before the question got to the part about it being about future conduct as a minister, which undoubtedly, undoubtedly, Madam Speaker, was within standing orders. Entirely within standing orders. And so in that context, Madam Speaker, we have no choice. We either accept a situation where this parliament becomes a joke. We either accept a situation where this parliament becomes a place where this government can cover up and be answerable to no one, or we move to set in a ruling that could not possibly have been accurate for one very simple reason, Madam Speaker. How can you rule a question out of order that you haven't heard? Yeah. Is the motion seconded? I call the honourable member for Hunter. It is, Madam Speaker. Motions of dissent in the Speaker's ruling are not motions to be taken lightly. And this opposition does not take them lightly. It's why dissent motions are so rare in this place, because oppositions use them guardingly. And whether, it doesn't matter whether we like the Speaker or dislike the Speaker, it doesn't matter whether the Speaker has a reputation for fairness or otherwise, oppositions generally are reluctant to move dissent. But we had no choice today, Madam Speaker, clearly no choice. For a start, as the, leader of op the manager of opposition uh, business pointed out, you did not even let me complete my question, Madam Speaker. And if you had, you would have come to the conclusion, surely, despite the pressure from those who sit opposite, that the question was entirely in order. Now, there are a number of principles here. For a start, Madam Speaker, the, question, the opposition under the Westminster system has limited opportunity to hold the government to account, or more particularly, to hold government ministers to account. And question time is one of our few opportunities. And when you prevent us from exercising that Thank right, you. Madam Speaker, you not, under, un, not only undermine our cause, but you undermine the very nature of the Westminster system. And the question today, Madam Speaker, was a very serious one. It was one which picked up on the very serious re reflections of Justice Brett and of the High Court, who himself expressed grave concern about the actions of the, the now minister back in 2011. And if you had allowed me to complete my question, Madam Speaker, you would have found that I was most interested that the Prime Minister has by now reassured himself, felt confident that all the minister's actions between 2011 up until this date, including his 20 months or so as a minister, have been appropriate and within the standards of his own ministerial uh, code of conduct. That's what we would like to know, and I'm hoping that the Prime Minister is now reflecting on that question I've belatedly put, and he will come back to the House and give us a reassurance in some future time, hopefully sooner rather than later, that he has reassured himself that this minister has not operated outside his own ministerial code of conduct. Now, Madam Speaker, I said question time is a time to hold ministers to, to account. And this is a minister who certainly needs a lot of supervision and needs to be held to, an account, to account. This has been a chaotic minister. This has been an incompetent minister, Madam Speaker. This is a minister who is prepared to come into this place provide an answer which is a total embellishment total embellishment of the effectiveness of his drought policy and then go back and change the hand side entirely change the hand side to, to change what he said in this place then of course he denies he denies ever knowing about the hand side changes madam speaker until i raise them in this place well we know that we know thanks to the senate estimates process that that was not the case, Madam Speaker. Now, Madam Speaker, this is not the first time you have denied me an opportunity to ask the Minister for Agriculture a question. And on both occasions, I would put it to you, there was nothing extraordinary about those questions. They were questions which were entirely consistent with questions asked in this place on a daily basis, questions which you regularly allow to go through on the basis of the standing orders. There was nothing special here, Madam Speaker. A simple question to the Prime Minister. Is he confident that his minister has been compliant with the code of ministerial code of conduct? Remembering 
This is a minister who promised the agriculture sector a white paper by Christmas. We are now 20 months into the term of this government, and we have not had any agriculture policy in this country. Policy inertia writ large. And yet, Madam Speaker, those on the other side don't want us to ask a question of the Minister for Agriculture because he, they know he is a person who is running a chaotic operation that has backflipped on all his pre-election promises, is constantly in the media for all the wrong reasons, and they know on that basis that this is a minister in need of protection. Well, I said to you before I sat down, Madam Speaker, we shall return. We will be back. There will be plenty more question times, and there is a limit to the extent that the Leader of the House can give you the nudge and the wink whenever he believes one of his ministers is in need of protection. This is not a protection racket, this place, Madam Speaker. This is the national parliament of this country, and we are entitled to ask question, ministers' questions when we believe they have misled the Australian people or they have acted in a, in a way which is contrary to the when national interest. time has elapsed. I call the Honourable the Leader of the House. Well, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, what an extraordinary performance from the member for Watson. Uh, the member for Watson has obviously been taking acting lessons, Madam Speaker, over the summer break, because I think his uh, performance in this extraordinary debate today would make Laurence Olivier blush. Uh, it was so over the top. I think most people haven't seen a performance like that since Theda Barra in the silent movies, Madam Speaker. <laughs> I, mean, I was embarrassed, Madam Speaker, that the member for Watson could get himself so worked up about a matter that is so vitally important to the nation, so vitally important to the nation that it took until question 20 to be asked about on question time today, Madam Speaker. Listening to the member for Watson, you would think the most heinous crime in the history of Federation had been perpetrated by the Minister for Agriculture on the Australian policy, Madam Speaker. And yet it took until 3.05 p.m. in question time for the first question to be asked. Now, Madam Speaker, usually when the opposition wants to build up momentum, when they want to get to a crescendo, bring the House to boiling point that would require a dissent in the Speaker's ruling or a motion of censure against the Prime Minister of the Government, usually there's a bit of spade work that goes into it, Madam Speaker. It usually starts at about 2 o'clock. It starts about two o'clock, and then by about quarter to three, the manager opposition business, the leader of the opposition, are talking about whether now's the time. Do we do it now? Do we bring the trap shut right now, Madam Speaker, while we're still on television, or do we wait and keep building the momentum for the great crescendo, the great performance, the magic trick, the smoke and mirrors that will bring the house down, Madam Speaker? That's what usually happens. <laughs> now, Madam Speaker, I know a bit about that because I've done that myself a bit over the years, no. uh, with a bit of success. No. And the member for Grindler, he's done it a bit over the years too. He, I, he was blushing with shame, Madam Speaker, dare I say it. <laughs> blushing with shame during the member for Watson's performance because he knows it was all very half-cocked, Madam Speaker. It all went off very half-cocked. And at five past three, the opposition rose to its feet to bring the Minister for Agriculture down. To bring the Minister for Agriculture down, Madam Speaker, to get his scalp, Madam Speaker. Now, sadly, the opposition is desperately floundering since the budget. That's what is absolutely apparent, Madam Speaker. The opposition has run up the white flag on the budget and are looking for any distraction that they can find. They have spent 18 months, Madam Speaker, basking, relaxing, lying on a banana lounge, sucking on a vanilla milkshake, thinking this is all very easy. We'll all be back in government. All these lovely front benches think they're all going to be ministers in 18 months, Madam Speaker. They've done none of the hard work necessary in opposition to convince the Australian public to change the government. They thought it was all going to be plain sailing. The member for Watson, of course, a great downhill snow skier, as we know, Madam Speaker, thought all he had to do was bend the knees, bend the knees, Madam Speaker, and he would get into government at the next election. Well, sadly for them, the budget has been very well received. The government is getting on with the job of doing what small business need and require to create jobs, of doing what families want 
in terms of childcare and support for them to get back into the workplace. The government is focusing on productivity and participation and population. The government has switched the agenda, Madam Speaker, to the things that the Australian public want to talk about. The Australian public want to know what the government's going to do about jobs, and they got the answer in the budget. They want to know what we're going to do about productivity, and they got the answer in the budget. They know that we're bringing fairness into the workplace through the changes to the paid parental leave scheme, Madam Speaker. They know that we want to reduce the tax burden. We want to cut spending. We want to achieve savings and, by this way, make the country prosper and the economy grow. But when they look on the other side of the House, Madam Speaker, they see a blank page. They see the future is now. They say, we are us. They say, them are you, or whatever the latest expression is. They say, I don't know what she said, but I agree with it anyway, Madam Speaker. They say, it doesn't matter where you start as long as you get somewhere in the end, Madam Speaker. The member for Jager Jager says that the money has to be paid for by somewhere. Somewhere's got to pay for it. They've got to find the money somewhere, Madam Speaker. The problem is the Australian taxpayer are looking at the opposition and saying, what would they do if they were elected? And what they know is that they would increase spending. They would cut the savings of the government. They would increase spending by $16 billion in foreign aid alone, Madam Speaker. They know that they would increase taxes. They would bring back a they would introduce a super tax of 15 per cent on self-funded retirees. They know that the opposition is utterly unreconstructed since the chaos and circus-like atmosphere of the Rudd Gillard Rudd government, Madam Speaker. So what they're doing instead, led by this very weak leader of the opposition, led by the weak leader of the opposition, they're looking for distractions. Now, the distraction, Madam Speaker, I think, quite wrongly, has been marriage equality, Madam Speaker. I think it's very wrong on an issue that is extremely important to a lot of Australians and extremely important to members in this House to be handled deftly and carefully and successfully. Instead, the Leader of the Opposition is playing politics with marriage equality as a distraction from the budget. And he must be surprised, Madam Speaker, surprised that the Greens don't support his push, that the marriage equality lobby has been lukewarm in their support for the uh, leader of the opposition's bill, that the opposition or the government hasn't rushed to support it, because that was supposed to distract people from the budget, Madam Speaker. Marriage equality. The next thing to distract people from the budget was to not keep up with the bipartisan position on national security. The member for Grandville, Most appallingly, Elizabeth Madam Speaker, the, the government has put on the agenda taking away the citizenship of dual citizens as our latest measure to protect Australians, to protect Australians from the threat of terrorism. And yet the opposition is playing politics, Madam Speaker, with the national security in order to try and distract people from the budget. Minister, resume your seat. The member for Perth on the point of order. Absolute, Madam Speaker, absolutely zero relevance on the part the of, member the, will resume uh, her of seat. the. The member will resume her seat. The minister has the call. The member for Hunter. Now, the minister Madam has Speaker, the call. as the member for Perth would know, a dissent motion in the Speaker is a very wide ranging debate. <laughs> and uh, I'm taking the opportunity. To be wide-ranging, Madam Speaker, because the sadness, the sadness for the opposition is that national security was supposed to be the distraction, and now they've fallen upon this as the distraction. It things that the Minister for Agriculture is accused of doing well before he was a Minister of the Crown, Madam Speaker, in a private capacity. The opposition's waited until five past three today to move to ask a question, and now move a motion of dissent in the Speaker. The reality is the opposition is now trying to find a new weapon of mass distraction from the budget. This government has absolute confidence in the Minister for Agriculture. The Minister for Agriculture is doing an outstanding job. He's recovered the live cattle trade. He's increasing the agricultural exports from this country. 
agricultural prices are increasing. States like mine in South Australia are benefiting from increased sheep uh, meat prices, increased wheat prices. The Minister for Agriculture is doing a fantastic job. He and the Minister for Industry are reforming country of origin labelling laws in this country. He is not overreacting to television reports uh, and closing down whole industries. He's building the country, Madam Speaker, and the Prime Minister and the government have absolute confidence in the member for New England to continue as the Minister for Agriculture, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, it's quite possible this is the worst opposition ever in Australia's history. It's quite likely that the Leader of the Opposition is the weakest and laziest Leader of the Opposition in Australia's history. The reality is, Madam Speaker, they would have been better off having a proper, drawn-out brawl for the Labor leadership and fought over what they believed in, rather than all forming a circle after the trauma of the Rudd Gillard Rudd years and saying, let's all pretend there are no dysfunctional elements of our party. They haven't cleansed themselves. The public know it, Madam Speaker. And on that note, I move that the motion be put. The question is that the motion be agreed to. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. I declare the motion carried. We will now put the question of dissent. All those in favour of the motion of dissent being carried, say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. <laughs> you better be all round for a cup of tea. <laughs> right, we now move to uh, presentation of papers. I call the. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. <laughs> We're well, having a division. You think it was a change of government? <laughs> I thought you'd just given up. A few more places to go to
Lock the doors. The eyes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. And I appoint as tellers for the eyes the members for Lawler and Shortland, and as tellers for the eyes the members for Bass and the member for Parks. The result of the division is eyes 49, nose 80. The question is therefore negative. <laughs> I call the Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I move that further questions be placed on the notice paper.
but, uh, but uh, none, uh, nonetheless, Deputy Speaker, this is a motion to suspend standing orders, and the member Order. for Cook. You never got to be Speaker, Bromer. The, no, the minister has the call uh, and will and address the member, his point of order. The, the, the member for Cook uh, 